of these meetings were emotional. These families got to tell their truths. As Felonis Floor has said many times, our family's blood is on this legislation. And so we want to make sure that it's meaningful legislation. Families who sadly know all too well about the grief and pain from police shootings go to Congress and the White House, pushing for meaningful change. And there's hope. One day after President Biden's address calling for Congress to deliver police reform by May 25th, there's rare bipartisan optimism about a compromise tonight. As America's largest city moves to reopen by July 1st, serious concerns tonight about what reopening means in part of the country where Americans are still hesitant to get vaccinated. A bold plan to manufacture one billion shots of the J&J &J vaccine in potential jeopardy after the FDA halted new production of a key ingredient at a Baltimore plant. Our report on the history of problems at Emergent Biosolutions and what comes next. Also tonight, a push to make it harder to protest, gaining momentum across the country. Republicans in nearly three dozen states considering a wide range of rules. One bill even proposing immunity for some drivers who ram their vehicles into protesters. Why states are even considering the new rules and are they constitutional? The price of freedom? As you U.S. soldiers start heading home from Afghanistan. We're learning more about why America decided to pull out and what may come next for the war-torn country. And the erosion literally eating away at the homes on the Great Lakes. Our Ginger Z with the homeowners taking matters into their own hands. Some of them hoping to save the only homes they've ever known. And good evening, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with promising news during the pandemic. In more than half the country, cases are going down. And tomorrow, the U.S. is expected to top 100 million Americans fully vaccinated and communities are moving to reopen. In New York City today, Mayor Bill de Blasio declaring the city will fully reopen by July 1st. Governor Cuomo saying it may happen even sooner than that. But with the promise of a better summer ahead, a warning tonight from officials, herd immunity cannot be achieved if more Americans do not get vaccinated. Communities across the country, like Tulsa, Oklahoma, urging residents to get a shot saying they can accommodate hundreds more people per day. Our Whit Johnson leads us off tonight from New York City. Tonight, New York City, once the epicenter of the coronavirus, announcing plans to be fully open for business by July 1st. You've gone out, you've gotten vaccinated, you've done so much to fight through this crisis. Now we can see that light at the end of the tunnel. New York coming a long way since those dark days of soaring death tolls and boarded up buildings. The new goal, 100% capacity in most businesses by July. But Broadway not expected to fully reopen until September. It's music to my ears. We've been waiting a very long time. More than half the country now seeing coronavirus cases fall in the last week. Still, there are hot spots like Colorado, Washington State, and Oregon, where indoor dining is now banned in 15 counties after a surge in hospitalizations. We know this virus is an opportunist. If there are pockets of places that haven't been vaccinated, large communities, that is where the virus is going to strike. Nearly one in four Americans say they're not inclined to get a vaccine. Demand still dropping in some areas. Our Marcus Moore is in Oklahoma. At this FEMA vaccination site in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they can do 3,000 shots a day, but only are averaging about 200 a day. Across the country, the number of shots falling from 3.3 million on average in early April to just 2.6 million per day. We're going door to door, knocking, uh, just trying to draw people in. In South Carolina, Candace Counts has a message for Americans who don't want to get vaccinated. She felt that way too. I was not going to get it. I was the main one saying, don't get it. But she's changed her mind after watching the virus take the life of her healthy 66-year-old father in just weeks. Now she's gotten both shots of the vaccine and is encouraging others to do the same. For weeks of him being in the hospital, nothing is as bad as what he went through. Just do your research and get the vaccine. 
Witt joins us now from New York City. Witt, we have new numbers in tonight about the millions of Americans who are not returning for a second dose of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. What do you know? Kira, we know that about 5 million people who got their first doses may have skipped their second doses. And a new survey in the New England Journal of Medicine found that many Americans are still confused about the timing of protection and the necessity of that second shot. But health experts are reminding people that you have up to six weeks to get that second dose, and it's critical for full protection. Kira. Wit, thanks so much. President Biden marked his first 100 days in office with a drive-in car rally in Atlanta earlier this evening. It comes after he delivered his first joint address to Congress last night. The president trying to sell his big agenda, including nearly $4 trillion in new spending on his infrastructure and family plans. So can he get the votes in Congress to make the plans a reality? Here's ABC's senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. On his 100th day in office, President Biden today heading out to sell his massive recovery plan. Stopping as he left the White House to pick up a flower for the First Lady. Biden traveling to Georgia, the state that handed him a Democratic majority in Congress. Madam Speaker, the President of the United States. As the country turns a corner on the pandemic, the president is trying to build on that momentum, pushing sweeping changes that would transform the economy and expand the role of the federal government. We also need to make a once-in-a-generation investment in our families and our children. He's calling for more than $4 trillion in new spending, proposing a massive child care and education plan, including universal pre-K, tuition-free community college, and paid family leave. He's also urging Congress to pass his infrastructure bill, arguing it will create millions of jobs. The American Jobs Plan is a blue-collar blueprint to build America. And he's That's turning to is. Vice President Kamala Harris to help get it done. Harris last night making history. Well, Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President. No president has ever said those words from this podium. No president has ever said those words. And it's about time. Republicans cheered that moment, but little else, especially not Biden's plan to raise taxes on the most wealthy Americans. He could have done his speech in about 30 seconds. He could have walked up and said, I'm President Biden. Thank you for watching. Here's my message. I want all of you to send every bit of your money and freedom to Washington. And Mary Bruce joins me now. Mary, the president is out on the road selling his plans to Americans, but he seems to still be facing a pretty uphill battle on getting any Republicans in Congress on board. What's the timeline trying to move forward with these measures? Well, the president does plan to sit down and meet with Republican leaders next week. He says he's open to other ideas. He's willing to give bipartisanship a shot here to a point. The president stressing, quote, doing nothing is not an option. But going this alone, trying to do this just with the support of Democrats, that's not a given either. We have seen some Democratic senators like Joe Manchin, Kristen Sinema, voicing some concerns not only about the scope and the overall price tag of this bill, but also some concerns about the way in which the president wants to go about paying for all of this. So you are absolutely right, Kira. Bit of a long road ahead here. Mary Bruce from the White House for us. Mary, thanks. Well, we head to California now, where yet another family is mourning the loss of a loved one at the hands of police. Three officers and a parking enforcement employee have been placed on leave after body cam footage shows officers restraining a man by using their knee. Despite the man asking them to stop, the officers continued, their actions ultimately resulting in the death of Mario Gonzalez. ABC's Matt Gutman brings us all the details. Tonight, the Alameda Police Department promising full transparency over the death of 26-year-old Mario Gonzalez. After officers appeared to put knees on his back and elbows on or near his neck to restrain him. The incident began with two 911 calls on April 19th, a seemingly disturbed man. There's a man uh, 
in my front yard kind of talking to himself. After reports of possible intoxication and suspected theft, officers respond to the scene, all of it caught on their body cameras. When they encounter Gonzalez, he appears to be incoherent but not aggressive. They note the alcohol in those baskets. I'm concerned about this open container. And try to lead him away. Come over here, we don't want you to fall down, okay? But then they try to restrain him, twisting his arm behind his back. And when the cuffs come out, Gonzalez resists. Hey, Mario, do it. Do me a favor, okay? Don't do it. Stop, 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 stop. Seconds later, they all go down. The officer struggling to restrain him for the next five minutes. They try to calm him down. It's okay, Mario. Oh, my gosh. We're going to take care of you, okay? All the while, the knee of at least one officer appears to be on his back. And it stays there for over two minutes and 30 seconds. Think we can roll him on the side? I don't want to lose what I got, man. 15 seconds later, they realize Gonzalez is weakening. We have no weight on his chest. They attempt CPR for the next five minutes until paramedics arrive. The Alameda police stating that Gonzalez had a medical emergency. He later died at the hospital, leaving behind a four-year-old son and the Gonzalez family demanding justice. The Alameda Police Department needs to explain why a perfectly healthy man who was never charged with a crime was killed in their custody. Matt Gutman joining us now. So Matt, what are officials there in Alameda saying tonight? They're saying that they're investigating the mental health aspect and it's going to be a pretty significant role in the multiple investigations into this incident. Um, we're also hearing from the family's attorney and they are saying that they're going to pursue a civil rights violation um, suit against the police department in federal court. Um, and the city council is now also chiming in saying that on May 8th, and they just announced this a couple of hours ago, they're going to hold a special city council meeting to review their police department's handling of mental health calls. So a lot is going on over this incident. Kira. We'll follow it all with you, Matt, as it continues. Matt Gutman, thanks so much. There's some hope on Capitol Hill tonight that a bipartisan police reform compromise could be agreed upon sooner than later. President Biden calling on Congress to deliver legislation to his desk by the symbolic date of May 25th, the anniversary of George Floyd's death. There was bipartisan optimism today as well after a round of talks and a desire to produce some results. Take a listen. Do you think you guys are pretty close? I don't know. I think we're trying hard, and if you try hard, you usually get to where you want to go. And how's it working with Representative Bass? She's wonderful. Have I you... probably just ruined her political <laughs> career, but she's wonderful. <laughs> Never met a more reasonable person. <laughs> Oh, you're really <laughs> I love it. More reasonable person. Let's bring in our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Let's hope things got a little bit more reasonable, Rachel. An unlikely alliance there between Republican Lindsey Graham and Democrat Karen Bass. I like that he's keeping his sense of humor. He always does. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing about today's talks? Well, Kara, I've got to tell you, progress is not really a word I hear very often here on Capitol Hill from both Democrats and Republicans. But roaming the halls today, that's exactly what I heard from Senator Tim Scott, a Republican, and Senator Cory Booker. They said that they are making progress on this issue of police reform. They both want to get something done. Obviously, President Joe Biden setting that ambitious timeline of May 25th, marking the one-year anniversary of George Floyd's death. There is definitely a lot that they agree on. And then, of course, today you did have the families here on Capitol Hill as well, speaking to lawmakers, sharing really what it's like for them to, to want to see legislation and want to see change get passed. So there's a lot of common ground, still some issues to be worked out here. But both sides are signaling that they feel like they can reach a deal on this, Kira. Well, let's talk more about the families uh, and their their lawyer, Ben Crump, just finishing up uh, there at the White House where they express, a, I guess, more optimism about this bill. What do you think it will take to get this to the finish line? Well, and I think the families today, too, I mean, this is so personal and so emotional for them. And so the family said that these meetings did get emotional. Uh, ben Crump, the attorney, saying that this legislation was written with the blood of George Floyd. And so they want to be involved and make sure that if there's going to be change, it's going to be meaningful change. But one of the biggest sticking points here is that issue of qualified immunity. Republicans do not want to alter it. Democrats do. So they're still kind of going back and forth, trying to figure out 
out a way to reach common ground on that. But both sides signal that they do want to get something done, and there is some common ground on banning chokeholds, for instance, creating uh, you know a national database to monitor some of the police incidents that are going on as well. So both sides are working this out right now. It is clear that the families are still going to want to stay involved. President Joe Biden and the White House has been communicating with the family of George Floyd. They say that they want to get this done. They say they are taking this very seriously and the families believe them. The big question is just like how soon is it going to happen? I think there is some sensitivity here, at least from some of the families that I was talking to today, that we go through this song and dance after we see uh, the death of black men and black women being killed by police, where we have these bipartisan talks, but in the end, nothing happens. And so only time will tell. One source telling me today that a deal isn't done until it's done, and we definitely have a little bit of ways to go, Kira. Oh, we all know it's the time for change. Rachel Scott, thank you so much. Thanks. We shift to a disturbing story at a Bowling Green State University now. Today, county prosecutors announced indictments against multiple fraternity members allegedly involved in a hazing where a young man paid the ultimate price. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Stone Foltz was 20 years old, pledging Phi Kappa Alpha fraternity at Bowling Green State University in Ohio when he died of alcohol poisoning just days after an off-campus initiation event. He was an amazing kid, just an absolute loving kid. The fraternity now permanently expelled, and tonight, eight former members have been indicted in connection with Fultz's death on charges ranging from hazing to evidence tampering to first-degree manslaughter. We believe and allege that hazing was an integral part of this event. Stone told his mother beforehand the event would involve drinking. I said, well, that sounds really stupid, and he said, it's just part of the ritual I have to to, but I don't want to. Prosecutors say Stone and other pledges were given a full bottle of hard liquor and told to drink it all. Hours later, Stone was found unresponsive in his apartment. Okay, are, you, are you starting the compressions again? Yep. Fultz died three days later. So to me, he was forced into something that the outcome is he, w he was murdered. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. So, Stephanie, do you know if authorities are looking into other possible suspects? Yes, Kira. So the prosecutor today said more people could still face charges. He said that they are looking at more individuals who may have been a part of that gathering, involved somehow. He says he doesn't believe this was a one-time hazing event. He thinks this was a, quote, integral part of the gathering. Uh, also, something else he said today that was interesting, he said he's not trying to send some larger message about hazing to students uh, across that campus, but instead focusing on the fact in that case and also said that he hopes to not have to prosecute a case like this ever again. Kira. So what's next for the men who have already been charged? So those eight former fraternity members are scheduled to appear in court May 19th. So that's when we'll see them again. Kira. It's a tough story to hear, especially when you're a parent. Stephanie Ramos, thanks so much. Mm. When we come back, two deputies killed, the 13-hour standoff, and now the investigation into how it all unfolded. Johnson & Johnson shots are going back into people's arms, but one of its key suppliers of vital components still shut down as the company tries to fix cross-contamination and other quality control issues. It's our vaccine watch. Also up next, in one state, you can hit a protester and receive civil immunity. In another, it's illegal to taunt an officer. Our look at the new rules targeting the social justice protests. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. 
Roberts. Robin Roberts. George Stephanopoulos. Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show. ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News honored winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. President Biden says he had no advance notice that the home of Rudy Giuliani was going to be raided. Former President Trump's personal attorney is under investigation for alleged lobbying in Ukraine. Biden says he's sticking to his promise to not interfere with the Justice Department. Nearly a year after the murder of George Floyd that set off dramatic protests nationwide, tonight there is growing Republican backlash in almost three dozen states against the demonstrations. Lawmakers are introducing stiff new penalties for public disorder and in some places proposing immunity for drivers who plow into protesters with their cars. Here's our Devin Dwyer. Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! Don't shoot! Tonight, the right to protest in the streets. What do we want? Justice! What do we want it now? Facing growing pressure from state Republican lawmakers. It is the strongest anti-rioting, pro-law enforcement piece of legislation in the country. And there's just nothing even close. So-called anti-riot legislation in Florida and nearly three dozen states aims to crack down on public demonstrations, like those that swept the nation after the shocking murder of George Floyd in police custody last year. If you riot, if you loot, if you harm others, particularly if you harm a law enforcement officer during one of these violent assemblies, you're going to jail. The civil unrest in Portland, Oregon, and several other cities has become a fixation of many Republicans far from the scenes. Some now demanding tougher penalties for vandalism, harassment of police, and acts of civil disobedience. At least 90 bills targeting protests have been introduced across 35 states since last May. We haven't seen anything like this in, in our experience tracking these trends. Uh, and unprecedented in, in their nature and the extreme lengths they go to uh, to restrict and chill protest rights. Civil rights advocates say many of the new GOP bills challenge the First Amendment right of people peaceably to assemble, effectively reclassifying protests as riots and punishing innocent bystanders if even a few bad actors turn violent. The laws create a situation where uh, peaceful protesters are caught up in these uh, criminal charges, which oftentimes carry very serious penalties, where an individual is, is deemed guilty of an offense uh, by virtue not of their own conduct, but of the conduct of and, and actions of people around them. An independent analysis of 12,000 demonstrations over the last year found most were peaceful. 96% had no property damage. 98% had no injuries reported. But Iowa legislators passed a bill this month to make being present during a riot a felony. We're going to up the penalties for rioting because what we've seen is not peaceful protesting. What we've seen is destruction and damage in our communities that we should not be standing for. I really think this bill unnecessarily pits law enforcement against 
groups like Black Lives Matter and other protesters just at the time when we need to be bringing all of these groups together. Kentucky Senate approved a bill making it a crime to taunt or insult police. In Indiana and Minnesota, bills would cut state benefits for anyone convicted of unlawful assembly. And Oklahoma is one of several states extending immunity to drivers who unintentionally hit protesters with their cars. It's really about protecting folks that get caught up in the melee. In Tulsa last year, the driver of a red pickup truck towing a horse trailer was swarmed on an interstate during a protest. Several people were injured. The driver, who reportedly feared for his life, was not charged. They need to extricate themselves if they feel like there's imminent harm, and that's what the bill does. It gives them immunity to get out of the situation if, if, if imminent harm is there. To me... These are encouraging rioting um, and murder and mayhem in a number of ways. Susan Bro knows firsthand the danger of cars hitting protesters. In 2017, her daughter Heather Heyer was struck and killed by a self-described neo-Nazi on the streets of Charlottesville. There was no one around his car. Um, he could not claim self-defense, although his defense in court did try it. While Hire's killer is behind bars, her mother worries new immunity laws could encourage future car attacks. I know that Minneapolis and uh, Seattle frightened a lot of people. I get that. I, w I would have been terrified myself, uh, regardless of which side I was on. But I haven't seen those kinds of riots and protests happen and a lot of the places that are having these laws put in place now. The wave of protest legislation in part reflects our polarized political divide. 82% of Democrats say the right to peacefully protest is very important for our country. But only 53% of Republicans agree, down more than 10 points from just two years ago. I think some of these bills are so extreme that they, they won't pass. Um, but it's also the case that more bills have passed at least one chamber of the legislature at this point um, than we've ever seen in, in prior comparable periods of um, uh, in prior years. The Republican push drawing immediate legal challenges in court as one of the most cherished American rights, the right to protest and speak out, now a major flashpoint in our national debate. For ABC News, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. And our thanks to Devin. Still ahead here on Prime, Lady Gaga's dog walker shot and five suspects arrested. More on the investigation. And more than a third of all cigarettes sold in America could be taken off the market. Why the FDA is moving to ban menthol cigarettes. And our economy is starting to gain steam. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Happy 10-year wedding anniversary, William and Kate. fascination with criminal trials and figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. A 
Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. And now to some positive news about the U.S. economy. We're seeing clear signs that Americans are spending more money and businesses are ramping up. Here's a look at the new data by the numbers. The U.S. economy grew 6.4% annually in the first quarter of 2021, which brings the country's GDP within striking distance of pre-pandemic levels. Quarterly growth was an impressive 1.6%, driven largely by a surge in consumer spending. That's according to the Commerce Department. And last month, U.S. employers added 916,000 jobs, the largest gain in more than a year. And weekly unemployment claims has fallen to 553,000, a new pandemic low. America's economic recovery is expected to accelerate even further as more COVID restrictions are dropped. For example, New York City's mayor said today he wants a full reopening by July 1st. And some economists now predict that U.S. GDP growth could reach 8% for 2021. We still have a ton to get to here on Prime. Hail the size of baseballs and the storm system that caused this kind of damage on the move. The growing concerns that the Taliban may try to attack U.S. forces as we leave Afghanistan. What's being done to stop that from happening? And keeping the Great Lakes great. It's this week's It's Not Too Late. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they're loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC.
most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. City, once the epicenter of the coronavirus, announcing plans to be fully open for business by July 1st. You've gone out, you've gotten vaccinated, you've done so much to fight through this crisis. Now we can see that light at the end of the tunnel. The new goal, 100% capacity in most businesses by July, but Broadway not expected to fully reopen until September. It's music to my ears, we've been waiting a very long time. More than half the country now seeing coronavirus cases fall in the last week. Still, there are hot spots like Colorado, Washington State, and Oregon, where indoor dining is now banned in 15 counties after a surge in hospitalizations. Nearly one in four Americans say they're not inclined to get a vaccine. The FDA announcing today is taking steps to ban both menthol-flavored cigarettes and all-flavored cigars. It says the goal is to reduce the number of kids who start smoking and the number of deaths, especially among low-income populations and minorities. 85% of all black smokers use menthol cigarettes, compared to just 30% of white smokers. And while we've seen declines in menthol cigarette use among non-Hispanic white youth, we have not seen the same declines in youth from communities of color. Smoking the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. The heaviest rains right now in upstate New York, northern parts of New England, stretching down through Kentucky and all the way back through Texas along that slow moving front, which does push to the east tomorrow. By tomorrow morning, that low will be parked right over Boston. So heavy rains tonight, but the winds are really going to crank around this. High wind warnings I expect tomorrow could see 30, 40, maybe 50 mile per hour winds across parts of the east and cold. So a cold and blustery start to the weekend in the east. The CDC is easing up some requirements for cruises to resume sailing. The agency says it remains committed to cruises resuming by midsummer, and companies will no longer have to conduct test cruises if 98% of their crew and 95% of their passengers are fully vaccinated. The CDC says eliminating risk on cruises isn't possible, so the goal is to mitigate it. Five arrests have been made more than two months after Lady Gaga's dog walker was shot and her dogs kidnapped. The shooting sent 39-year-old Ryan Fisher to the hospital, who has since been discharged. Lady Gaga's dogs were returned two days after the kidnapping by Jennifer McBride. She is one of the suspects arrested and has been charged with accessory attempt murder. The four other suspects are documented Los Angeles gang members. Detectives do not believe Fisher was targeted because of the dog's famous owner. Instead, they say the value of the dog's breed was a motivation for the robbery. Part of the lineup here. Oh, oh wow. Close call for Philadelphia Philly star Bryce Harper last night after he was hit in the face with a 96.9 mile per hour fastball from St. Louis Cardinals reliever Genesis Cabrera. Harper luckily didn't sustain any major injuries. He walked off the field without assistance in the sixth inning. Face is still there. So we're all good. The night ended with Cabrera apologizing for hitting Harper and the Philadelphia Phillies walking away victorious, winning the game five to three. Well, it was a 13 hour standoff that resulted in two sheriff's deputies shot and killed after responding to a call that a homeowner and his family didn't report to work. Steve Ovesensami has more now from Boone, North Carolina. A sheriff north of Charlotte is sharing tonight that another of his deputies has died after police responded to this home. Police in Watauga County, North Carolina, were called to make a welfare check and were gunned down by a man inside on Wednesday morning. We've got an officer shot. They share that they were called to the home just days before over issues with a 32-year-old who they're now identifying as Isaac Barnes. He was waiting. Uh, for the officers and we'd had an issue with him over the weekend. Sergeant Chris Ward and Deputy Logan Fox are dead. Authorities say they were ambushed in a stairwell inside the home. There's now a growing memorial outside the sheriff's office. Deputy Fox was just 25 years old. Sergeant Ward was just 36 and a father of two who married his high school sweetheart. He died after being flown to the hospital. It's hard. I know God's got another angel. The standoff at the home lasted well into the night. Thanks again to our Steve Osinsami. Well, Johnson & Johnson has plans to deliver 1 billion doses of its one-shot COVID vaccine around the world by the end of the year. But its plans may hinge on a plant charged with producing the key ingredient needed for the vaccine, 
which is now on hold due to quality concerns with the site's manufacturing process. Bob Woodruff takes a deeper dive into the problematic history at Emergent Biosolutions in this week's Vaccine Watch. Even as vaccinations with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine resume across the country, manufacturing at one key facility is still on hold. Emergent, a company that was developing a key vaccine component for both AstraZeneca and J&J, &J, accidentally cross-contaminated potentially millions of doses of key components of both of the two vaccines at one of their facilities in Baltimore. This mishap ruined the key initial ingredient slated to produce millions of Johnson & Johnson doses. Because of that, the FDA temporarily halted new J&J &J production there in early April, and AstraZeneca no longer produces its vaccine ingredients in the facility at all. The issue was identified as part of uh, rigorous quality control system checks, and HHS uh, made us aware late last week. Back in 2012, this facility was financed with the government's help in case of an urgent public health threat and was one of the few that could produce key and specific vaccine components. Then last June, Emergent was granted a $628 million contract by Operation Warp Speed to help produce those key ingredients for COVID vaccines. But in an inspection early this month, FDA investigators say that key problems had not been resolved, including potential cross-contamination of vaccine substances, unsanitary conditions, and a lack of adequate process control procedures. The FDA saying the firm failed to adequately train personnel. Tonight, new details about Emergent's past track record on a range of potential quality issues. ABC News obtaining FDA inspection reports through regulatory intelligence company Redica Systems about facilities operated by the company and its subsidiaries spanning more than a decade. The reports detail problems across several facilities across the globe, mold, peeling paint, stained ceiling tiles, leaks and cracks in critical equipment. And in April 2020, just as the country was in its first lockdown, FDA investigators reported that the crucial Baltimore plant was not doing enough to prevent contamination or mix-ups. While the company has had problems, Emergent is hardly the first to be rebuked by the FDA. And FDA gives companies time to respond before threatening to shut them down. Every um, inspection starts with the quality management system. You know, does it look clean? Does it look maintained? But when FDA investigators visited emergence facilities, they found problems that needed to be addressed more than 90% of the time, above the FDA's average rate of 50%, according to Redica Systems. Emergent claims identifying deficiencies is part of the regulatory process, especially for the type of products they make and that they have responded proactively and voluntarily to correct any deficiencies. Emergent saying in a statement, we take responsibility and are working swiftly to fix the issues raised by the FDA. We are working closely with FDA and Johnson & Johnson to resume new production as quickly as possible. But former FDA investigator Stone says the inspections are intended to prevent potentially catastrophic consequences. There's, there's a lot of uh, quality control checks that are required. Now, um, if, you know, you're trying to do something rapidly and you're uh, cutting corners in that process, then you're going to have these cross-contaminations where you'll have two different products uh, in one vial or in one batch or in one uh, a lot. Uh, of product. In February, before its issues were made public, ABC News took a tour of Emergence Baltimore facility. Senior Vice President Sean Kirk spoke with our Eva Pilgrim about the safety of their site. 
You can see these controlled area manufacturing suites. They have purified air, people are gowned up in them, all with an eye towards safety of the product. It's it's very, like, this is the no-go area unless you have permission. Yeah, that's why we're shooting through the win hit window here today, because we do have high levels of control that we apply in these areas to ensure that no unwanted contaminant, foreign particle, bacteria gets into the manufactured process itself. Emergence says the rapid scale-up has never been done before. When opportunities for improvement were identified, we responded proactively. Just this week, the White House COVID response coordinator, Jeff Zients, said in a private call with governors that the plant is under Johnson & Johnson's supervision and is working to address the problems. Even when they secure the FDA authorization, there will be a significant number of J&J doses made available in short order. And that could be potentially sometime in the next couple of weeks. And this could be a significant number of J&J doses, possibly but lawmakers have now announced an investigation into the company. So what's the reason for the investigation? We need to see how this mistake happened so we can prevent it in the future. Democratic representatives Carolyn Maloney and James Clyburn asking in a letter why Emergent received that multi-million dollar contract despite a long documented history of inadequately trained staff and quality control issues. We are in the process of receiving a uh, the documents, they have to be reviewed and looked at and questions need to be answered and there will be a hearing later on in May. No COVID-19 vaccine components manufactured at Emergen have been released for use. J&J &J instead relying on their facility in the Netherlands for the key ingredient. The FDA, Emergen and J&J &J have all voiced their commitment to upholding the highest safety standards. This is Bob Woodruff tracking the vaccine. Well, a small number of U.S. military personnel have left Afghanistan as America's move to end the longest war is drawing closer. The president has promised to pull the remaining 2,500 troops out of the country by 9-11. The Taliban demanding they leave by Saturday. Ian Panel remains in Kabul for us tonight. Tonight, a U.S. official confirming to ABC News that America's troop withdrawal from Afghanistan has begun. A small number of military personnel already gone. Now America's top diplomat here telling ABC News the Taliban, who are demanding the U.S. stick to the original deadline this Saturday, may be preparing to attack troops as they leave. We're all concerned about what will happen. We have very clearly and loudly publicly warned the Taliban against any uh, against any actions against coalition forces. All U.S. and NATO forces are now scheduled to leave by September the 11th, ending America's longest war. And in his speech before Congress, President Biden doubling down on that decision. After 20 years of value, valor and sacrifice, it's time to bring those troops home. But as they go... The security situation here is dire. The UN reporting more than 1,700 civilian casualties in the first three months of this year. The ambassador... Ian Panel joining us now live from Kabul, Afghanistan. Ian, the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan says the decision to withdraw was made after commanders actually concluded there was no way to win this war? Yes, that's right, they did. Uh, and he said it's something that they'd come to the conclusion about some time ago. Uh, the US ambassador was an interesting interview. I mean, he wanted to stress some of the gains in the country, and that is important. There have been substantial changes here, but he also seemed fairly realistic that there wasn't a prospect of some kind of military success on the battlefield, but he also wanted to stress that the U.S. Embassy is going to stay here and that the U.S. will continue to be engaged, although he conceded that if that doesn't happen, then there's a fear here that you could perhaps repeat history. In other words, what happened after the Soviet Union withdrew and the U.S. again pulled out its support for any kind of development here in Afghanistan. Um, but also, I think, some concerns about what the next few days holds and also what the future looks like as well. And let's talk about the future uh, for a moment here. You've been traveling around Afghanistan. You brought us a powerful story last night. We know that the threat from the Taliban is real. It's present. Is there a sense from people that you have been talking with that the situation there, that life as we know it there, could rapidly deteriorate once the U.S. leaves? 
Yeah, I mean, there really is a collective sense of fear and dread. Uh, as you say, I've been coming here quite a long time, and uh, every time I come back, things have changed. The infrastructure generally kind of improves. The lives of people has been on the up. But the security situation is really bad. In fact, the UN mission here in Afghanistan uh, just had a report out about the first three months of this year, and the casualty figures are horrific, and they're going in the wrong direction. So I think there's a sense that the security situation is already uh, deteriorating. There have been a lot of targeted assassinations, especially against women, against those who've spoken out against the Taliban, against the militants. Uh, and whether you are girls going to school, uh, whether you are people going about your job, whether you're an ordinary family who sends their kids to school every day, uh, there is some sense of dread about what the future may bring, whether the Taliban comes back or whether there's a return to some kind of civil conflict. We're already seeing some of those warlords who were around in the 1990s rearming their groups, uh, saying that they will stand against the Taliban if they come back, but it was that kind of posturing that led to the civil war which ultimately led to the Taliban in the first place. The future doesn't look great, but people are trying to cling on to the hopes that they, uh, that the gains that they've already made can be maintained. And I think, finally, there's one sense here that so much has changed over the last 20 years, it's going to be very hard to put that genie back in the bottle. People have got interconnected, especially young people with the outside world, and it's not going to be so easy for the Taliban just to march in, to overthrow the Afghan army, and to restore the old days. Kira. Yeah, holding on to hope and change, uh, indeed. Ian, thank you so much. Well, many families across the country are getting ready to hit the road this summer, but a possible gas shortage could put the brakes on those plans. ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has more on why it's happening and what you can do to plan ahead. A warning from the tanker truck industry saying some stations may run out of gas this summer and not because of a gas shortage, instead a trucker shortage. Last year during the pandemic, many of the drivers retired or they went to different industries and that created a shortage. According to trucking trade group National Tank Truck Carriers, up to a quarter of all tank trucks in the country that carry gas are parked because they don't have the drivers. So far, it's only affected some stations in Las Vegas and Northwest Arkansas. But come this summer, experts say we may see shortages in vacation hotspots. What we're looking at is the summer. Um, in terms of this happening most likely in spots that are very popular in terms of travel destinations for the summer. So beaches, so mountains. Truck driver Jeremy Johnson doesn't carry gas, but he's seen the problem firsthand. Well, through the pandemic, there was a lot of people, a lot of guys that, that were single owner operators that uh, went out of business because the rates went so low. Demand for gas is already reaching pre-pandemic levels. In fact, if you look at just the week of April 12th from last year, we saw people taking about 4 billion trips under 25 miles. Compare that to the same week this year, nearly 6 billion. So do you think that people should be panicking and sort of going out there and buying as much gas as they can? There is no reason to panic by. I can tell you that much. Because when this has happened, the few isolated incidents that we've seen, it's happened to a chain or a brand in a market, not the entire market. And our thanks to Geo. Finally tonight, adapting to a new reality along the banks of the Great Lakes. Families who have lived there for generations now dealing with erosion caused by climate change. In this week's It's Not Too Late, our Ginger Z shows us how residents are taking matters into their own hands in the fight to save their homes. not the ocean. This is Lake Michigan, one of the five Great Lakes. The five massive lakes straddle the U.S.-Canada border. In them, more than 20% of all the fresh water on the planet. And in the past year, they've seen the highest water levels ever recorded. And now, increasingly violent storms are pushing that high water against the shoreline, eroding it, sending homes crashing into the water. You just hold your breath when you feel and hear the winds start to rattle the windows and you go, here it comes. 
in the last 18 months, this gorgeous lake has been torturing the people that live here. The highest water levels in more than 100 years of records. It has families like the Grays that live in this house behind me, literally living on the edge, concerned with each storm that their home will go down. It just collapsed. And it keeps collapsing. Oh, absolutely. When we bought it, as Joe said, it was about a 45 degree angle. It was all vegetation. We had a deck cantilevered out over the bluff. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And now it looks terrible. Looks, you know, looks like a garbage field down there. The Grays are throwing a Hail Mary. They just want to save their home. They've installed a 550 foot steel wall with their neighbors. It's reinforced by boulders and sand, but the installation costs about $2,200 per foot. And this type of erosion protection is not covered by most homeowners insurance. Because it's water-based, it's more under a flood. It's called a natural event that is the reason why you can no longer build properties within 500 feet of the shore. Let me break it down. The Great Lakes have cycles, high water and low water, and that happens just about every 30 years. But in the last seven years, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron have gone from their lowest water levels on record to the highest, an unprecedented swing that water scientist Alan Steinman says is the result of climate change. When you look at all the evidence, temperature, hydrology, hydrodynamics, and that's a factor of greenhouse gas emissions and the human impacts that we're having on a planetary basis. Steinman and so many others calling for a global carbon diet. We have to reduce our production of greenhouse gases. That way we could slow down the warming of our planet and help preserve the Great Lakes. Fresh water is right here, right at, you know, that we're looking at and it's gorgeous, it's beautiful and we want to protect it and preserve it for the future. Not just for us, but for future generations. Thanks to our Ginger Z. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. You ever look out your window and see a mountain lion? Probably not, but this California couple did, and they just started recording. They say it actually looked like the mountain lion was watching their TV, but in reality, it was looking at the family cat, which was minding its own business in front of the wooden stove. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kira Phillips in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the Justice Department has charged three white men with hate crimes for the death of Ahmaud Arbery, who was shot and killed in broad daylight while jogging, triggering a national outcry for justice. And actor Dax Shepard opening up about his sobriety struggles and how he talked to his children about it. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. 
I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Somewhere out in the country, there's a man. I'm Bobby. Doing good things for good people. He'll walk a mile in their shoes, <laughs> then get him a brand spanking new pair when he's done. Just wanted you to have this. Thank you. You name it, whoa, whoa, whoa. he'll try. <laughs> Even if it breaks him. Bobby Bones, they're trying to break you. Oh, great. Breaking Bobby Bones. New series Monday, May 31st at 10 on National Geographic. tonight. Thank you, David, for showing us the love. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. Do you believe we want to The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. I'm Kira Phillips in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News this hour. Family members of the victims killed in police involved shootings up on Capitol Hill today demanding reform. Relatives of George Floyd, Eric Garner and others met with lawmakers on both sides, including Democratic senators Cory Booker and Tim Scott. Scott, as you recall, gave the response to President Biden's speech last night and has been leading the GOP effort to nail down a police bill. Biden is urging Congress to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act before May 25th, the one year anniversary of Floyd's death. President Biden, one day after his big speech, spent part of the day in Georgia meeting with former President Carter's wife, Rosalind. Biden is trying to sell two massive bills with a price tag of $4 trillion. It faces stiff opposition from Republicans. Prosecutors in Ohio have indicted eight former fraternity members for the death of Stone Foles. Prosecutors say the Bowling Green State University sophomore died after being forced to drink an entire bottle of alcohol in a short period of time. The charges range from hazing to manslaughter. And now to the promising news on the pandemic. Cases are going down in many states and some places are even moving to reopen. But there is concern tonight about not enough Americans lining up to get the vaccine. Our Whit Johnson reports. Tonight, New York City, once the epicenter of the coronavirus, announcing plans to be fully open for business by July 1st. You've gone out, you've gotten vaccinated, you've done so much to fight through this crisis. Now we can see that light at the end of the tunnel. New York coming a long way since those dark days of soaring death tolls and boarded up buildings. The new goal, 100% capacity in most businesses by July. But Broadway not expected to fully reopen until September. It's music to my ears. We've been waiting a very long time. More than half the country now seeing coronavirus cases fall in the last week. Still, there are hot spots like Colorado, Washington State, and Oregon, where indoor dining is now banned in 15 counties after a surge in hospitalizations. We know this virus is an opportunist. If there are pockets of places that haven't been vaccinated, large communities, that is where the virus is going to strike. Nearly one in four Americans say they're not inclined to get a vaccine. Demand still dropping in some areas. Our Marcus Moore is in Oklahoma. At this FEMA vaccination site in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they can do 3,000 shots a day, but only are averaging about 200 a day. Across the country, the number of shots falling from 3.3 million on average in early April to just 2.6 million per day. We're going door to door, knocking, uh, just trying to draw people in. In South Carolina, Candace Counts has a message for Americans who don't want to get vaccinated. She felt that way too. I was not going to get it. I was the main one saying, don't get it. 
but she's changed her mind after watching the virus take the life of her healthy 66-year-old father in just weeks. Now she's gotten both shots of the vaccine and is encouraging others to do the same. For weeks of him being in the hospital, nothing is as bad as what he went through. Just do your research and get the vaccine. Thanks, Witt. And for more now, we bring in former CDC acting director, Dr. Rich Besser, now CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Rich, good to see you again. Nice to be here, Kira. Well, as we just heard, COVID-19 cases and deaths in the U.S. are coming down. That's good news. We seem to be turning a corner. But at the same time, about a quarter of Americans still say that they're not inclined to get vaccinated. So do you think we can achieve herd immunity despite this vaccine hesitancy? Or do you expect that the virus could just keep spreading across the country? Well, I, I think herd immunity is going to be a real challenge, but herd immunity isn't really an all or none kind of thing. The more people who get vaccinated, the less transmission there's going to be in communities. And uh, I, I think we need to set people's expectations at the same le at the appropriate level. There was all of this massive demand for vaccine, and that is being met now in more and more states. And as that demand is, is, is met, we need to change the approach and go after those people people who aren't aren't those who've said, no, there's absolutely no way I'm going to get a vaccine, but are either on the fence or will get vaccinated if we make it as easy as possible. So it's going to be more of a trickle, a slow increase. But I expect that as more people know friends and family members who've been vaccinated and, and see the things that people can do safely, we're going to slowly see those numbers of vaccinated continue to rise. So the big story today, as you know, we've been talking about here in New York City, is that the Big Apple plans to fully reopen by July 1st. So are you comfortable with that timeline for New York in particular and elsewhere? Well, you know, when, when you say fully reopen, you have to think about what that what that means. It's not going to be what things were like before the pandemic. There's still going to be settings. If you look at the CDC guidelines indoors where people are going to be uh, uh, required to wear masks. Uh, we're going to be in a situation in July where still uh, likely that no children will have been vaccinated and a lot of the public ha haven't been vaccinated. So while we will be getting closer to normal and all businesses will be open, we're going to find, I think, that a lot of businesses will require masks indoors, movie theaters will require masks, but there's a lot more things that we're going to be able to do than we can currently do. Now, overseas, one of the other big stories, India, uh, which is seeing more than 370,000 new COVID infections a day with a healthcare system truly on the brink. So, so th should the international community be doing more uh, from stopping the crisis there and stopping that momentum against the virus elsewhere? Yeah, you know, transmission of the virus anywhere in the world is is a threat to people everywhere in the world. And because of that, and just because of the moral and ethical uh, 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 value in contributing to, to stopping this and saving lives, we all need to do more. And from a U.S. perspective, I know that there are med medical supplies that are being set. But we need to look at our own vaccine stockpiles and say, you know, what is it that we truly need and at what pace? Uh, uh, what is our vaccine supply looking like and, and how much more will be coming? And make available to other countries vaccine that we don't need in the, at the present time. Uh, I know that there's efforts to send AstraZeneca vaccine once the FDA has certified that it's uh, safe and appropriately manufactured. Uh, but we need to look at the vaccine supply overall. And if there's enough for everyone in America who wants to get vaccinated, provide it to other countries so that they can protect their citizens as well. Agreed. Pay it forward. Another big headline today, as you know, the FDA plans to ban menthol and cigarettes. Tell us why you think this is an important step, both for public health and also for equity. Yeah, you know, this is absolutely monumental. There's 500,000 people every year lose their life related to tobacco. It's the most it's the biggest preventable source of death uh, in 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 our country. And if you look at who who is smoking menthol cigarettes, 85% uh, of African Americans who smoke smoke menthol and that's because of the racist approach of tobacco companies targeting people of color, targeting young people. You can mask the harshness of tobacco with menthol. And so by banning menthol, it is going to lead to fewer people beginning to smoke 
smoke, and it will make it easier for some people who are currently smokers to stop. This is absolutely huge. All right, good. I like wrapping it up on a, on a good note. Dr. Besser, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. Three men in Georgia have now been indicted on federal hate crime charges in the death of Ahmad Arbery, the young black man who was out jogging last year when he was shot and killed. The Justice Department announcing these charges as it also looks into other high-profile cases surrounding race relations in this country. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. More than a year after his shooting death, the family of 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery now closer to justice. Three Georgia men indicted on federal hate crime and attempted kidnapping charges. A grand jury finding they used force to intimidate and interfere with Arbery's right to use a public street because of his race. Federal officials saying Travis McMichael, his father Gregory, and William Bryan saw Arbery jogging last February, began to chase and yell at him, then blocked him in with their truck before the younger McMichael fired his gun, killing him. Attorneys for the men calling the decision disappointing, denying any wrongdoing. They've pleaded not guilty. The Biden administration's Justice Department actively investigating several high-profile race-related cases across the country, including the fatal police shooting of Andrew Brown Jr., killed last week during the execution of a warrant for felony drug charges. My dad got executed just by trying to save his own life. If any of my deputies broke any laws or violated any policies, they will be held accountable. Following the guilty verdict in the Derek Chauvin murder trial, the entire Minneapolis Police Department as a whole under scrutiny. The DOJ looking to see if there's a pattern or practice of unconstitutional or unlawful policing. Those investigations and the recommendations and actions that ensue do not only protect individual civil rights, they also assist police departments in de developing measures to increase transparency and accountability. And now to help us unpack the legal issues here, we bring in Shauna Lloyd, a civil rights attorney with the Cochran Firm. Shauna, good to see you. These three men charged in Ahmaud Aubrey's death were already facing state charges that include felony murder. So walk us through what's different about these new federal hate crimes that they're charged with. Well, these federal hate crimes are allowed when you are specifically committing a crime against someone based on certain protected classes. Race would be one of them. So they feel that they have a very good case by saying the only reason that this act or crime was perpetrated was based on his race alone. Georgia did not have one of three states that did not have a federal uh, state hate crime, so they're able to bring it at the federal level. So prosecutors need to prove a very specific kind of intent to convict someone for a hate, a hate crime, right? So let's talk about how difficult that can actually be. Correct. You have to show that this act was perpetrated because of the person's race or other protected class. What they're going to look at are actions. They're going to look at what was said. It is said that there were racial slurs that were uttered that are heard on the video. That's going to be something that they'll look at. They'll look at group affiliations. If there's been any sort of disparaging marks, comments, or other affiliations with groups that have this type of hateful attitude towards a specific race in this case. Do you think we'll see federal civil rights or hate crime charges um, against Derek Chauvin and the other three former officers in connection with George Floyd's murder? That'll be an interesting one to see. I think that now that you they were able to get this conviction, you're seeing additional charges. You're seeing these things being looked at, the pattern and practice of the police department, because they're recognizing that there were things about this that were probably racially motivated. And so you're going to see a lot more of these charges coming forth under this administration. So, you know, we've talked about the fact that the Justice Department has announced investigations uh, into the Minneapolis Police Department, also the Louisville Police Department. Police in those cities were involved, as we all know, in the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. So what kind of potential civil rights issues do you think uh, the DOJ would look for? 
the DOJ is going to look very heavy into the pattern and practice of these police departments. They want to find out if it was a standard way of doing business in that particular police department, if it was done where it was racially motivated, did it disparagingly impact certain races or certain ethnic groups. They're going to be looking very heavily into training, into the culture of the police department. They'll talk to people in the community to see whether or not there was this type of pattern and practice that allowed for this type of behavior to happen repetitively, specifically targeted at people of a certain racial group. So, Shauna, as a civil rights attorney, I'm curious, have you seen a shift in the way this Justice Department handles race-related cases compared to how they were handled by the last administration? Absolutely. We're seeing a lot more charges come out of the DOJ, even in the short time, regarding these particular types of cases. They are becoming more active. We're seeing states that are now, Georgia specifically, that enacted a hate crime. People are becoming more, and the, the Justice Department is becoming more involved in these cases as they become more prevalent under this administration. Shana Lloyd, I always appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a bit of a different turn now, talk about entertainment news. We're going to head to Hollywood, where actor Dax Shepard is getting pretty candid about his recent relapse after 16 years of sobriety. The co-host of the wildly popular podcast, Armchair Expert, revealing now in a new episode how he and his wife, actress Kristen Bell, actually told their two young daughters. Zareen Shaw has more. Actor Dax Shepard revealing how he and wife Kristen Bell told their girls about his recent relapse after 16 years of sobriety. When they relapsed, we explained, well, daddy was on these pills for his surgery, and then daddy was a bad boy, and he started getting his own pills. Shepard sharing on Chelsea Clinton's podcast, the relapse turned into an opportunity to be honest. They know that dad goes to an AA meeting every Tuesday and Thursday. This has been like a second chance to confront all those things that have been building up. Experts say addiction is a family disease because everyone is impacted. The family needs to be part of the solution. It is the biggest opportunity family. They're the most important group in that person's life long term in their recovery. Shepard first publicly opening up on his podcast last September about relapsing with prescription pain pills following a motorcycle accident. I'm making you feel crazy and I'm making Kristen feel crazy. And then I tell you guys everything. Yeah. And I give you the remaining stuff I have. And I say, um, please help me because mm -hmm. I'm not doing this well. You will run into almost nobody who doesn't have one person in their life that's addicted. People like Dax, they have a, a big megaphone and they can make a big difference. A big difference for fans while potentially setting an example for his kids. The proudest I am of my children ever is when they admit something and say sorry. It's the bravest thing to own your shortcomings. Good message. Our thanks to Zoreen. Still to come, Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny seen for the first time in public after ending his hunger strike last week, denouncing Russian President Vladimir Putin as a naked thieving king. We're also monitoring some breaking news out of Israel. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. 
ABC News. Honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime. Cinematic. Real life drama. Stunning. The unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime. 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Well, we are tracking several international headlines at this hour, including some breaking news out of the Middle East. Israeli military deploying a team to help with a rescue effort underway that's unfolding at this major religious festival in the northern part of the country. Emergency officials telling ABC News dozens of people have been killed, even more injured. It's still not clear what has led to this incident, but we do know a stampede definitely took place. The COVID crisis in India continuing to grow worse. More than 379,000 new cases today and 3,600 deaths. The State Department is urging Americans to leave there as soon as possible and not to travel. The first shipment of emergency supplies from America are expected to arrive there tomorrow. Well, fierce Putin critic Alexei Navalny, seen for the first time since his hunger strike, insults Putin in a court appearance. A judge upheld his conviction for defamation today in a court appearance. Navalny also taking a moment to describe himself as looking like an awful skeleton. Well, staying overseas, Prince William and Duchess Kate are celebrating their 10th wedding anniversary today, releasing these new photos to mark the occasion. All the while, a lot of questions about the House of Windsor and if the monarchy can modernize for the future. ABC's James Longman has more from London. As the bells of Westminster Abbey rang that day, the House of Windsor rejoiced. The second in line to the throne had found his bride. Soon after, a son. The succession was secure. I think they were seen by the royal family as, you know, the ticket to their survival. They had the approval of a lot of young people. Um, they had the approval a lot of a lot of people in the Commonwealth. Attention turned to Harry, and when he married Meghan, the new royal generation seemed complete. But now the Sussexes are breakaway royals, and the Fab Four, as it was briefly known, is no more. I think Prince Harry and Meghan leaving the royal family has created kind of a dichotomy and put them both at odds with each other, these two couples. And I think a lot of people see Meghan and Harry as representing the kind of progressive, modern side, and William and Kate being kind of old-fashioned right now. And that's despite their relative youth. William and Kate still hugely popular, but Harry and Meghan's departure hit the family where it hurt. And I think for a lot of young people of ethnic minorities in this country, watching the first person of colour in the royal family having to leave, that is going to have changed a lot of people's opinions. When Prince Philip died, hearts around the world broke for the Queen. And we were reminded, after her decades of faultless public service, of inevitable changes on the horizon. It's not a job you can just retire from or stand down from. And I think that they'll find a way and the Prince of Wales can support her. And one day she will be gathered and he will be king. An almost unthinkable thought, Britain without Elizabeth. I do think that after the Queen dies, there will be an intense period of questioning of the royal family. And anti-monarchist sentiment is growing in this country, especially amongst the younger generation. And I think the Queen's successor will have to do a lot of hard work to gain the trust of the British people. And in the shock of that moment, he will be the stability by being the continuity of an institution that has been going for a thousand years, 
around which the nation can move forward, constantly modernise and make sure that its political democracy remains vibrant. In the age of King Charles, William and Kate will be the next Prince and Princess of Wales and will have to carve out new roles to support the Crown. The monarchy is always changing. It has to reinvent itself in order to survive. I have to do something that's seen as a break with tradition, that's seen as a break from the establishment, which so many people have a problem with at the moment. The British monarchy has survived a thousand years of uprisings, rebellions and one, albeit short-lived, revolution. The next challenge, surviving modernity. And our thanks to James. Finally tonight, it might have sounded like a silly idea, but it was hard fought and ended up making quite a difference. Lindsay brings us a story about the Battle of the Joshes. While it has a heartfelt ending, it all started out as a joke. Hundreds of people armed with pool noodles, duking it out at Air Park in Lincoln, Nebraska. With just one thing in common, they're all named Josh. Josh, 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 Josh. A shared namesake just joshing around as they fight for the title of number one Josh. Josh Swain says he dreamt up the idea in a moment of pandemic boredom. We fight, wrote in a Facebook chat. Whoever wins gets to keep the name. Three, two, one. And one year later, they came in droves. The Battle of the Joshes was hard fought. But ultimately, it was the smallest Josh who emerged the victor. Four-year-old Josh Vincent Jr., dubbed Little Josh. The event raised more than $14,000 for the Children's Hospital of Omaha, the same hospital where little Josh was treated for seizures when he was just two years old. We just want to say thank to everybody that put this together. We are humbled and we appreciate it. Oh, we love you, Josh. That's our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kira Phillips in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks for streaming with us. Why the fascination with